Working Preachers, it's Christmas. We know you are busy people. You have a lot of demands on your life. So we just wanted to take a special moment here to say, uh, we see you. We see you. We uh, are blessed by you. The church is blessed by you and the way in which you proclaim week in and week out the good news that we are hearing uh, this Christmas season, the good news of Jesus' presence and God's presence. So thank you so much. Yeah, and this year it's not even week in and week out. It's uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, three days in a row for many of you uh, have services. And that's an, uh, a special w uh, experience of being worn out. I remember uh, my dad would often get sick right after Christmas just because of uh, uh, he's a pastor and getting worn down and your, uh, you know, your immune system is compromised. So thank you all for what you do. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Merry Christmas. Thank you for going through the year with us and for the year with your communities and your people. We appreciate you. And even if they don't take the time, uh, they're showing up year after year for those who are only on Christmas attenders or week after week. There's, that's an expression of gratitude. So we thank you for all that you do to make God's promise, presence, and peace made known. Uh, to the spheres of influence you have. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. It's the first Sunday of Christmas, December 26, 2021. The text for today are 1 Samuel 2, verses 18 through 20, uh, and verse 26. The Psalm is 148. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17, and our gospel is the second chapter of Luke, verses 41 through 52. And uh, for our uh, friends over the pond, happy Boxing Day. Indeed, two turtle doves today. <laughs> this is quick, Come, jumping into a Sunday, the day after Christmas. Absolutely. People are going to think, church again? But you've got a great text. Everybody wants to talk about 12-year-old Jesus. <laughs> well, and unique to Luke, right? This is, uh, this is the only time that we hear anything about uh, a young Jesus. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that's one of the things that you want to think about is, you know, what difference does this make as we continue on into Luke? And what, what is it that we're being... What is it being? What is what is it being revealed about Jesus? What is uh, how is this appearance? We talked about this uh, for Christmas Day, but how is this appearance of God's salvation for all, of God's grace for all? Uh, what uh, what is this going to mean for who Jesus is and how Jesus moves about in the world? And the the com the commentary by Wes Allen pointed out, I think, a really interesting and important aspect of this text. And that is the, the response of Jesus. Of course, this is, these are Jesus' very first words in the entire gospel. And, and the next words he will speak will be his sermon at Nazareth. And so I think that would be one thing you would want to do is to say, how are these words, how are those words connected? How are those words, uh, how are those words working off of each other, if you will? But then Jesus says to his parents in 49, why were you searching for me? Do you not know that I must be in my father's house? And then there's all kinds of uh, odd Greek things with regard to father's house, but that must be, or it was, it is necessary for me. And the way in which, uh, the way in which that necessity is deeply connected to, of course, God's or Jesus' relationship with God, or the way in which Jesus is that manifestation or appearance of God. And so the necessity for Jesus to be in connection with and, and the revelation of God is what's set up immediately and importantly, I think, in this gospel, uh, that, 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 is, that is who Jesus is, that Jesus is revealing the very heart of God, the very grace of God, the, 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 the salvation of God for all. And so we're reminded of that uh, in this story, I think. 
I want to just uh, bounce back to something uh, Matt's joke there about uh, two turtle doves. Uh, it is a reminder of um, the part of Luke that we skipped that we'll come back to later. Uh, that um, according to the law of Lowe's, uh, Moses, when they came up uh, for the presentation, that uh, Ray and Joseph offer two turtle doves, um, which is the exception in the law for a family that isn't wealthy. Uh, so I do think it's important emphasizing both the Jewishness of Jesus, uh, but also that Jesus was not born uh, into a wealthy family. All right, back, uh, back on track. Well, I was listening to NPR this morning and the, the, the 12 days of Christmas gifts are going to be hard to find this year. So uh, there's supply a chain problems, supply chain problem with doves and partridges and all kinds of wild game that you might want to have on your farm and have asked for Christmas. I mean, it's serious, like a serious thing. So that why it's going to take us so many uh, so long to get to the wise men's arrival. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This That's text uh, is a text that I have in, in my imagination based on a, a, a sermon that um, uh, Carolyn Gordon preached, uh, um, in, in, and you can find it, I think she preached it at Calvin College years ago. She's at Michigan Valley State University, uh, Mississippi Valley State uh, University, uh, but uh, she preached a, a, a sermon uh, uh, on this text, uh, and the question was how to raise a savior. And uh, she spends time um, uh, homiletically just playing with what it means that um, um, uh, Jesus uh, got lost or that his parents lost him. Or uh, if, we, if we keep the focus on Mary, that Mary lost Jesus. And uh, she has this wonderful line where she sort of says, you know, what do you do when you've been entrusted with God's son? And oh my goodness, you've lost him. Um, and um, she does a wonderful job with it, uh, that it, it has made an impression for me. Um, but it, it uh, makes a shift for me in terms of how we might preach this in a way that would keep that humor and keep that um, um, uh, impression lightly, but also ask us, have we lost Jesus in the midst of our celebrations, in the midst of our festivities? And uh, that might be a, a turn to take in just uh, reminding us of the things that we've talked about already of, of maintaining the Jewishness of Jesus, of maintaining the reality of the family, the earthly family that he was born into in their circumstances. Um, but also what does it mean to tell the story of God incarnate? Um, have we lost Jesus? And when we find Jesus, is the Jesus that we find truly a representation of the one that uh, we know as the creator of the universe whom Jesus called Father. There's a lot um, not to like about this passage for a lot of people. It's, it's a, a firm reminder that Jesus was Jewish, which people are willing to admit, but not always comfortable exploring in a lot of depth. I mean, he's not, he doesn't appear to be here embarrassing the teachers of the law he's in dialogue with them and he's learning from them and he's amazing them with his own insight and his own answers but you know this appears to be a, a learning experience for him and for those around him uh, it's also a clear reminder that he's a human being and so he he needs to grow and he's maturing and he's learning things uh, and he's experiencing life, not really as a child here, but you know, on the verge between childhood and being an adult in that society. Uh, and a lot of us are a lot more comfortable with a Jesus who's fully divine than we are with a Jesus who, who, who grows like this. The, the implication there is God is maybe learning some things from human peers in, in this moment uh, and from a relationship with his mother, which is there's a little bit of back and forth here where he's like, you know, shouldn't you know I'm about my father's business or I'm about my father's stuff? Implication being, I know Joseph's not my dad, <laughs> but, uh, but um, as well as his obedience to them, right? And Mary's pondering. I mean, so there's, it's not a situation where everybody gets it. And, and the, the certainty of Luke one as in some way, and Luke, the beginning of Luke two has in some ways changed now 12 years later and 
so just to explore that a little bit, this is one of the messages of Christmas and one of the messages of the incarnation. And one of the things that I think when we forget those two truths, Jesus' Jewishness and his humanity, uh, the church makes some of its worst errors throughout history. And by worst, I just don't mean intellectual mistakes. I mean, things where people get hurt uh, badly and, um, and, and the church uh, does damage. So maybe not for January, December 26, going too deep into all of that history, but just kind of helping situate Jesus in, in his real existence, which is why this passage, I think, is a real gift. And, and the, uh, the emphasis on Jesus' Jewishness uh, also points to the authority of the Old Testament. Uh, it, it's Paul who says, right, salvation uh, comes from the Jews, uh, that some, some people want to make the move. Um, oh, no, no, my ancestral stories are my Old Testament, you know, so the Nordic gods of Thor and Odin and Freya uh, and so on. It's actually not consistent with this story or with the rest of the New Testament. It says, no, salvation comes from the Jews. The scandal of the New Testament is, of course, the incarnation of God in one life. And the scandal of the Old Testament is that in order to bless the whole world, God chose Abraham and Sarah and their descendants. Um, I was talking with a friend recently who teaches uh, undergrad and was talking about how students hate that. Students hate the idea that God chose Israel um, to be the, the, the priestly nation, but I think it's essential. Ag agreeing with you, and uh, it's interesting because the reason folks don't like it is because they have uh, an opinion about the people that um, the Jews became, that Israel became. Um, I think it didn't matter who God chose. Uh, the circumstances of humanity is that we would find a way not to like that tribe. Um, so I think it, it's important for us to help folks to recognize these texts that we're pointing to, that salvation is from the Jews, that the promise uh, for all humanity was preserved um, uh, for all the tribes that were scattered at Genesis 11. They were preserved in the story of Abraham and Sarah that we begin to, that has begun to be told in uh, Genesis 12. And that's the hope of the world. It was then and it remains so now. And I think too, you mentioned this earlier, Matt, but the appearance again, the role of Mary, uh, and this is, this is really the last time we'll um, hear from her. And then the story then focuses on John and then of, of course, Jesus. But uh, the fact that there's this bracketing of, of these significant events or, or this reminder of these significant, significant events to, to stop and ponder, or in this case, to treasure, te reo, uh, to keep, uh, keep through or whatever. Uh, that 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 these moments are times for for deep 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 reflection and deep pondering as to what this has meant and what is it what is it going to mean and I think particularly with verse uh, with verse fifty two and Jesus increased in wisdom and in years in divine and human favor and what and what 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 is that going to mean and so it it's it's an important reminder that. Uh, that these stories, these stories then invite us to a kind of activity that is, that means thinking and wondering and pondering and treasuring and keeping, and that this is an act of faith. This is an act of, uh, an act of response to, an ongoing act of response to the incarnation and to Christmas. I love the story of First Samuel too. I'm not sure I love well, can it. Can I add that we this. will get? Can, can I add that we will get a piece of uh, a piece of Mary uh, in Epiphany in John two, right? Oh or yeah, seeing, I meant right? I meant Mary and Luke. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. I meant Mary. Don't show up in oh, Acts yeah. one. In Acts one, she gets mentioned just so you know she's still around oh, and yeah. alive. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
But in the gospel, right, you, you, I know, no, no, absolutely. In but, the gospel, yeah. yeah, biblical scholars work narratively. <laughs> the lectionary spins it around and takes it out of order. All right, back to Where Samuel. Were you, Matt? Uh, it's just it's it's kind of an odd place to uh, to put this story, which requires a lot of background. Um, Although if you did do a lot of work in Advent 4 with Hannah's song in comparison to the Magnificat, maybe you want to check in on, on, on baby Samuel and see how he's, how he's growing up as well and growing in stature and favor. But, you know, it's an odd pairing. I don't know that I would make much of it. And I don't imagine a sermon on 1 Samuel 2 being center stage on, on December 26, but and it is worth pointing out that uh, if you want to see somebody trying to make some kind of this text, the commentary on the website by my brother, Carl, whose birthday is December 26th. So it's uh, Caroline's birthday is Christmas Eve. Uh, Carl was missed being born on Christmas Day by about 10 minutes. Mm. But bad. there you have it. Uh, I do, you know, hey. You should read the commentary as a birthday gift to Carl. Yeah. Is that what you're and, saying? Yes. Yes, I think so. And uh Degree of difficulty. If 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 you get scored on your sermons based on degree of difficulty, preach on that. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, and he was a boy wearing a linen ephod. There you go. <laughs> all right, you all know what I'm going to say about the psalm. I use it liturgically. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. In some way, uh, shape, or form, but that that makes a whole lot of sense uh, when you have a psalm like this, don't you think? And you know what I'm going to say about it? What? Same thing I say every year, almost, or what's that? about this time of year, which is, this is, uh, you know, so, so the theme here of, of creation praising God, you know, it says, praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters, deeps, fire, hail, snow, frost, stormy wind, fulfilling his command. First of all, Caroline, would, uh, Snow is an unnecessary freezing of water. Exactly. Uh, a joke you make every year. Who said I that, do. by the way? That is Carl Reiner. There you go. But, and I, it is interesting. And somewhere on the website, I have a commentary uh, uh, either on this text or one of the other Psalms uh, from the Christmas season that, that pulls us out is, Notice just all the ways in the uh, in the Advent and Christmas carols that this theme of all creation praising God, you know, uh, even in joy to the world, you know, re, uh, that creation itself repeats the sounding joy and so on. Uh, it's, a, it's a fun way to tie it in and uh, make the singing of Christmas carols on this day a major part of of the uh, season because you know it, where we live, cool one oh eight, uh, you know, starting Thanksgiving day praise not, plays nothing but uh christmas songs all through but they've quit now uh they quit after december 25th uh because they don't know it's the third day of christmas matt by the way so uh partridge in a pear tree two turtle doves what's three three french hens there you go french hens there you go Th those those little you gotta little sing chickens, it the other way it's chickens. really hard and Four calling birds, five gold rings. Yeah, it's it gets harder if you go count There's up. Maids a leaping, yeah, and is, drummers isn't... drumming, and pipers piping. That's where the expense really comes in when you start talking <laughs> about trying to, you know, gift human beings playing instruments to other people. It gets really expensive in our Amazon hurry. doesn't deliver that so well. <laughs> but when we're talking about uh, all of creation uh, doing the praise, I think uh, Colossians picks up on that in terms of reminding us uh, that call to be one body. Um, it's, it's a text that just reminds us to be in community with one another. So one way of offering praise to God is extending hospitality to one another, bearing one another's bur burdens, uh, forgiving one another, um, uh, to uh, bind one another in, 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 in harmony. Uh, each of these, um, um, uh, expectations of, of the community of faith is an invitation for us uh, to be uh, the one body of Christ that is evidently extending hospitality one, to one another. And there we sing 
uh, sing songs and offer praise and give thanks. Um, if if, if uh, you pay attention to that, I think it's a wonderful way for us to actually, I don't like to always give instructions in sermons, but it's a wonderful way to give instructions for exactly what does it look like to offer praise to God in our lives. Yeah, that's a nice uh, link to, uh, to the psalm. Uh, there's an, here's, here's, here's another, another uh, sort of uh, fun way, you, you know, Jesus wrapped in bands of cloth, uh, Samuel's wearing a linen ephod. We are to clothe ourselves in compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and love. Nice. Move, nice Rolf. connection, Rolf. Very good. Yeah. Well, Nicely the, done. the, uh, the line from Colossians that I think you could use in some way, uh, homiletically or, or preach on, you could preach on this passage, I guess, uh, but it, uh, but the, the line that's, that, uh, really strikes me is, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And and uh, particularly in that theme of peace that we've ex that that is so present of Christmas, Christmas, right? The Prince of Peace, uh, peace among uh, peace among all, and and so then what does it mean that, that invitation for the for the peace of Christ to rule in your hearts? That's one translation. Another translation is, let's uh, let Christ's peace be the arbiter in your decisions. Uh, or adjudicate, arb arbitrate uh, are some other translations, which I think is really an, an interesting way to imagine. How does this peace rule in our hearts? How is it that this peace is, is going to be a part of who we are and how we are in, in this post-Christmas time? And so I, I, would, I would take a deep dive into that verb and and say what 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 does that mean what does that mean to uh to think about the way in which peach peace has a kind of hold on you that uh that is deeply embedded in uh in the way in which you make decisions or go about your go about your life or the way in which you arbitrate your your existence in the world uh, i think that's 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 a way to say Christmas is more than a day or a season or 12 days. It's, it's a way in which we as Christians live, that that peace is not, is not something necessarily that we have so much as it's something that we do. Uh, and so that's where I would go. I like that because I think we tend to think of peace very passively uh, uh, rather than being uh, really an aggressive lifestyle and activity. So I like that, Caroline. 